So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, hoping hoping uh, there's, there's some interesting conversations later on. Um, I've got an unusual job in a, a, an unusual business that isn't terribly well known, but uh, we kind of sit behind uh, the important things in life, like half of the frozen chips in the UK. So uh, Star Refrigeration uh, is a industrial refrigeration contractor. We have uh, a network of 12 service centres around the UK um, looking after a variety of different sorts of plants. So everything from Coca-Cola plant to uh, Royal Bank of Scotland data centres, but the, the frozen chips is uh, every single one of Tesco and Asda's logistics centres. Um, and they have about a dozen each. And our field engineers have to attend at short notice and, and look after them on a, a fairly um, ongoing basis. Um, and so that gives us a, a, a challenge in that. So part of my job is looking after um, the group sustainability of that in a inward looking sense. Part of it is the, the observant amongst you will recognize that is not a, a, an electric vehicle on the screen. Uh, a big part of our job is um, decarbonizing heat. So trying to encourage people to move away from burning gas and using big heat pumps. Um, and I'll give you some context of that. And part of it is data. And data is really what underpins uh, success or failure in, in most things. So very quick view uh, on this. We see any sort of change, um, not as a threat, but an opportunity. If we can position our business better for our customers um, and help them be better, that's a good thing. So change comes along. Um, you either stand like King Canute uh, telling the waves to go back out or you, you, you embrace it. So we certainly uh, would like to think we, we embrace uh, the opportunity. Um, to just finish the, the bit about the heat pumps, I'll give you a quick uh, view of exactly what that is. Just, um, it crops up all the time. This is Clydebank. Uh, the college is the black and white checked building there. And on the left is the energy centre that is now taking heat uh, from the River Clyde to heat all the buildings that are being built around here with uh, this, uh, we call them the twins because there's two and they're identical. But that's what we think of as a heat pump. It's a, a fairly large device. And that, that uh, sort of signifies where we're approaching um, industry um, and the sort of customers. So you can imagine that our customers have got uh, significant use for that. So if you're ever down in Clydebank, go and have a look. It's quite an impressive building. They've done a nice job of, of lighting up at night as well, which is nice. Um, why do we do it? And this is where we get into the transport, but the reasons for not burning gas are broad. Um, it's all about renewable energy and energy efficiency. So you're starting to see a theme that's maybe parallel. Uh, clean air is a massive part for us, and you can see a parallel with the transport, supply security, and of course, uh, local jobs. And an interesting thing, the more flexible devices we have on the, the UK electricity grid, the more um, Interruptible supply is probably the correct way of describing um, wind turbines. They're sometimes on, sometimes off. Um, but the more flexible stuff we have that we can switch off and, and change, um, the more um, of that generation, generation type we can have. And what that's also going to mean is the cost of that is going to vary significantly. So whereas we, we really stress about the price of petrol and diesel, but it's relatively stable. It does move. Clearly, we're in an upward move at the moment. But electricity is going to be very, very varied. Um, it's, it's already, as a domestic customer, you can have 48 different tariffs in a day. And that's going to affect the way that we view our fleet and how we operate that fleet. Because electricity, we have to be very careful we're not buying it at the wrong time because it will be awfully expensive. So part of my job is to do the SECR reporting uh, for the business. And uh, I've just completed this year's, and here's a quick snapshot. Um, so uh, combustion and fuel and vehicles, um, and then the, the privately owned vehicles our staff use and the total, and that gives you uh, around some of 70% of our carbon footprint as we measure at the moment is petrol and diesel, basically. Um, so our major, major focus has been on uh, uh, these sort of vehicles. Last year, it was 80%. So we've seen quite a shift in a year. Um, data always lies. That's the important thing to remember. That might just be a quirk of obviously uh, troubled times, COVID, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not really sure uh, how, how much it's moved, but I'll give you some, some insight of, I think we're pointing in the right direction, whether we're moving fast enough. So it was all about cars. And I should say that our, our engineers um, tend to uh, be allowed to use a, an estate car. So typically in history, it might have been a, a Volkswagen Passat to give you a, a sort of uh, touch and feel for it. 
But what we realized, uh, and other drivers as well in the business, um, and when we thought we need to do something different, I went for a test drive in a Model 3 uh, Tesla in 2019. It was above my budget, um, so I couldn't get it. And that was quite annoying because I really quite fancied one. Um, so I spoke, spoke to the accountant, and he realized, and he probably knew this anyway, but he realized the national insurance on the car that I used to have was significant. It was a, it was a 13.4% uh, 13 of the benefit in kind. I, the, I am... Uh, forcing the business to pay that um, as as uh, as a driver, so that was significant, and um, we realised that we need to take a different look at this. So we started measuring it differently um, because we wanted to reduce the the, the fleet impact. As I said earlier, um, two two point four million miles um, is quite a sizable amount of of driving. So clearly, we want to do less driving. That's a big part of it. We do a lot of um, remote monitoring of sites that so we're not actually driving at all. Um, the, other, the other aspect to remember is whenever our staff are driving, it's costing time as well. We, we have 50 uh, personnel days per year sat in a car driving uh, as, a, as a total. So that is clearly an opportunity to drive less. But ultimately, uh, we need to drive cleaner cars. That's, that's the short of it. So how do we switch from petrol and diesel to, to EVs? Um, I should say our fleet, some, some people are eligible for a company car and some people have to have a company car, a vehicle, it's a, it's a works van and some, some are, are private drivers and, and how, do we, how do we encourage them? How do we take them with us on the journey as well? So we fairly quickly identified that the shift was going to be uh, towards electric vehicles. It's the only game in town, basically. Um, all the other stuff might come along later, um, but uh, for now it's electric cars. Clearly the government are, are right behind this with, uh, what they're doing with the, the benefit kind rates. And so we worked out how to, to go about doing this. And uh, it, it really gave us, um, sorry, a bit fast there, how to justify more expensive lease costs. We, we tend to, I should have said, we tend to lease our vehicles from a provider. And that's an interesting thing because it, it, it wraps up a lot of um, residual cost benefit of, of um, less depreciating vehicles that people don't tend to to think about everybody always sees the upfront ticket price of a car but actually it's the it's the difference between when you when you buy it or ask someone to buy it on your behalf and when you release that back into the second hand market that's really what you're paying for so our lease provider we pay the depreciation we pay their their management time and of course uh, an element of profit as well so it's all about the depreciation and uh, electric cars are not depreciating the same way as other cars are so there's a, there was a terrific opportunity when we wrap all that together so here's the here's the maths but um, uh, Carol Vorderman style. Um, I quickly put all the, the data on the page and we'll see what it shows us. So we modeled it based on 20,000 miles of driving a year. That's, I'd probably say that was a high end and I'll show how the model is for a much lower. But basically, uh, that Volkswagen Passat equivalent was going to cost our business £8,200 per year. It was going to cost the individual staff member because, of course, they have to pay um, the, the personal tax on it, 4600 if we found a way for an electric car, we just took one example at the very beginning of the Model 3, we kind of decided we wanted cars that were 300 miles range. That, that to us was comfortable and not. I've, I've just done a trip last week down to Hull and back, and I was getting about 200 miles on, on most of a charge. So I think taking two thirds of the, the actual stated range is probably a sensible uh, thing to do. So um, clearly, big benefit. So in terms of uh, uh, enticing your staff and, and motivating them, um, big, big saving. It was, it was effectively the equivalent of a, a £9,000 pay rise, which is, uh, I challenge anybody not to say yes, please, to that. So, so good for staff, good for benefits, uh, good for the company um, and the finance director. It's good to keep him happy as well because um, there's quite clearly um, quite, quite a significant uh, saving there. Um, so... What we then noticed, uh, well, what if it's only 2,000 miles? And there's definitely a bit of a risk. Um, the cost to the company would be much cheaper if, um, if it was on the uh, uh, lower mileage rate. We're not recouping as much uh, mileage saving. And it basically works out at about five pence per mile in an electric car and about 15 pence per mile in petrol or diesel. So the company is saving 10p for every one of those 2.8 million miles that we uh, ask, ask the team to drive. So that's quite a quite a, a bit to play with. Um, so um, still not not quite so good for the company, but um, we're also wrapped up into this uh, modern way of thinking things uh, through. It's not always just about the the pound, shilling, and pence. Sometimes it's it's about other stuff. Um, so 
where did we get to? Um, well, uh, quite a few people quickly jumped on this and ordered up some some uh, Teslas. Um, the point of uh, the red circle on the roof is um, solar panels and the roof, clearly a big part of it as well. We're, we're not yet uh, doing any charging because there's pretty much nobody in the office, to be honest. Um, but also, we don't see a, a place of work charging as being a significant part of the future. We see people charging at home and charging away. We will put chargers in, but that will be for uh, travelling uh, guests to any particular one of our locations. Uh, so there's a, a safe haven, if you like, when they get to the meeting they might be going to. So in a year and a half or so, we've um, now currently got 54 diesel, 22 electric, 12 plug-in hybrid electric and seven hybrid vehicles with an average intensity of 78 grams. And we have a further um, seven diesels on order, um, 15 electric, two, two um, plug-in hybrid electric and two, two hybrids with an average of 43. So quite clearly we'll see the numbers slide in the right direction. It's sensible to say um, at the moment, um, let me just quickly zip through this, um, that we, we've not got uh, a fleet option for the engineers that are traveling out and about um, the heavy drivers, the, the engineers going to site uh, and load, loaded up the tools and so on. Um, I'll tell you shortly where we've just got to. Um, sorry, slightly different bit of this was um, the salary sacrifice scheme. We realized that quite a few of the staff aren't company car drivers. There's a government scheme called um, salary sacrifice. We set up uh, that scheme. So now any of the, the staff members can sacrifice some of their salary and take a personal lease. It's underwritten by the company. That's the way the scheme works, but it's effectively a personal lease uh, for a car um, to allow them to do that. Or indeed, uh, for a partner or a close family member, they can they can do that as well. And there's been a few, few folk have opted to do that um, that weren't part of the company car scheme. Um, and so slightly controversial because the scheme allows you to do it for any vehicle. We said right from the outset, we'll only do it for electric cars. We, we, we uh, had a bit of an argument uh, internally. Uh, I won um, and uh, it's only electric cars for the simple reason that we don't really want to be uh, promoting or pushing a perk that's pushing um, uh, petrol or diesel cars out into the marketplace for the next, you know, cars last so much longer than they used to, but 10 or 15 years, we don't want to be responsible for stuff that's still lying about in 10 or 15 years. By contrast to, we'd really like to encourage as many secondhand uh, electric vehicles into the market because all our lease cars at the end of the term, I don't know where they go, but they end up somewhere and uh, maybe at auction or maybe uh, pushed out into the secondhand private market. But that's every vehicle we do. We're creating a legacy um, going forwards with that. So uh, lessons in this, don't know yet, uh, a bit early. Um, we've not been driving much. There's a little bit um, of overnight charging. Anxiety is, is one of the things I'm still nervous about. I'd like to see a situation where hotels are basically offering a bed and charge. So you, you, book, you book a room and you book a, a spot for your car on a slow charger uh, overnight. It's a cheap form of charging. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, it's not super expensive, fast charging. But, you know, get somewhere, plug in and know that you've got a, a, a full tank, I suppose is the, the wrong metaphor, but a full battery um, for the next day. We do expect BIK rates to rise. Um, they're, they're locked in until 2025, I think, at 2%. Um, this cunning plan might completely unravel if um, I haven't checked the budget today, but maybe Rishi Sunak has announced it's 12% for um, uh, battery cars, um, but I hope not. And, uh, you know, we've got a significant headache coming because charging away from home is getting quite expensive. It's um, 30 to 40 pence per kilowatt hour. You get about three miles per kilowatt hour. So that's about 13p. But the, the, the poor driver can only claim uh, back 5p uh, through the government um, HMRC rules unless they can adequately demonstrate a, a higher cost. And that's really tricky to do. You know, my trip to Hull was charged up at home overnight. Now, how much did that cost? Well, somewhere between 5p and 16p, depending on, on whether I charged nighttime or daytime. And that's going to change in, in May when that um, deal comes to an end for me. So some, somewhere in the middle, call it 13p, and then I set off and I, I charged up at Scotch Corner and it was uh, 40p per kilowatt hour. So when you, when you average all that out, it is more than 5p. So we, we can't really be asking our staff to drive on their, on their purse. That's not right either. Um, so it's going to be uh, difficult. And this bit about the, the, the engineers, we took a, a test 
for two weeks of a score at ENIAC, which the engineers uh, really liked. Uh, the guy did a really good report down in London for us and uh, showed it was absolutely adequate. Uh, went to order one and it's a 12 month lead time. So uh, plans are sat on the shelf while we wait for uh, any cars to come along. And the salary sacrifice scheme, we just need to do more with that. So that's my rapid run through um, of what we've been doing. We might have got some bits of it wrong. I'm happy to, to be told that we're doing something daft. Um, but I hope that sort of shares a little bit of the thinking and the insight and the, the ambition of, of what we're trying to do.